Start your engines. The way it was in 92 when Nigel Mansell clinched the Formula One World Championship with a record number of wins, pole positions and fastest laps. A remarkable feat, the culmination of a lifelong ambition. And naturally the achievement was celebrated in style with the family at home on the Isle of Man. For 1993 a new challenge, Nigel and his famous Red Five transferred to the USA. It's history now that the triumphs continue. Another year of success. But on reflection, how amazing that after 12 years in the higher echelons of motor racing, Nigel had never won a title. He'd come close often, but suddenly he'd won twice in succession. Incredibly, in different championships. Formula One and IndyCar titles, back to back. More people have got in touch, more people have sent congratulatory telegrams and faxes and I think um, it's just excited a lot more people for the fact that it's just an incredible set of circumstances and doing it back to back. The Formula One title proved elusive for Nigel in 1991. For the following season, he switched his base from the Isle of Man, where he and his family had been so happy, across the Atlantic to Clearwater, Florida, to a climate that made winter training less of a chore. The magnificent house that became home had everything for an aspiring, and at times perspiring, world champion. He worked on a fitness program that was designed to return him to Formula One at leaner, fitter and stronger than ever before. It was as though he was preparing for a world title fight. And in a way he was, except that this one lasted nine months and took place at 16 different venues worldwide. The hours of toil and physical punishment paid off. He weighed in the lightest of his career when the season began. But it wasn't all work. The chance to relax with Chloe, Leo and Greg was always taken. The overwhelming win at Silverstone, the seventh in nine races, meant Nigel had won more Grand Prix than any other British driver. Another win and a second place later, the title was assured, all wrapped up by the middle of August. Mission accomplished, he went back all too briefly to the Isle of Man to a hero's welcome, only Britain's second world champion in 16 years. It had been a long road, but ultimately the sacrifices and hardships were worth it. But even though Nigel had achieved his goal, contract negotiations for 1993 weren't straightforward. That became apparent towards the end of the season. At Monza in September, Nigel, objecting to the way the matter was being handled, decided to leave Formula One. A decision that required much heart-searching and dismayed the many thousands of Mansell fans all over the world. His options were limited. Few racing teams had the talent and ambition to satisfy the reigning Formula One champion but a notable exception emerged. Thanks for coming here. Well, that's a good one, isn't it? I mean, obviously, uh, we signed for the Newman Haas team, and uh, that's going to be an incredible new challenge. Can't really tell you much about the cars. I've never driven one, never sat in one. Whatever it's going to be, it's going to be very exciting for everybody. Uh, I don't see any reason why Nigel can't, can't do that. I think he's going to catch on quicker than everybody thinks. Nigel's initial outing with his new team was at the Phoenix Firebird circuit. Getting to know the Newman Haas Lola before the start of the 93 season was essential. Built at Huntingdon in England with a Ford Cosworth engine, it's a beautiful sleek piece of machinery. Unlike Formula One, it's turbocharged, capable of reaching 100 miles an hour in four seconds without the aid of an automatic gearbox or traction control. With his great friend Greg Norman, Nigel first went to explore the circuit in a hired Cadillac.
Craig Norman's been a pal of Nigel's for years. Nigel, of course, a great golf fan. What would he give to be the Open golf champion? What would Greg Norman swap for a drive in Red 5? Nigel out on the circuit for the first time at real speed. The new boy settling in well. It takes time to discover all the subtleties of character of a racing car. Indy Racing's quite a change from Formula One. Just how much of a change is apparent at the very start, literally. It's a rolling start rather than static from a grid. Incidents on the circuit frequently bring out the yellow caution flag and the field packs behind the pace car. By slowing the race down for a couple of laps, it's a system that makes for close, exciting racing, one that's been adopted by Formula One in the last two seasons in an attempt to improve the overall spectacle of Grand Prix by providing races within the race. Pit stops are major parts of IndyCar racing. Unlike Formula One, it's not only a chance to change tyres, but to refuel as well. Methanol pumped into the 40-gallon tank at a standard rate. Perhaps the most notable change is that six of the 16 races in the IndyCar season are staged on banked ovals. Simply designed for high-speed racing, it's a technique that's foreign to drivers outside North America. When Nigel first decided to pledge his future to IndyCar racing, the cynics declared that the ovals would be too difficult for him to master in his first year. The Newman Haas team tested frequently at the Phoenix International Raceway pre-season. The most common advice given to IndyCar's most famous rookie, don't forget to turn left. In the heat of the Arizona desert, Nigel put up some impressive times. Watchful eyes on his progress, confidence growing all the time on both sides of the pit wall. At the end of a successful first test, celebration, a series of controlled spins to delight the onlookers. Nigel arrived back having learned all about his new Red 5. There was certainly no doubt about its power or its strength. What we have in front of us now is uh, my potential race car for the Indy World Series. Obviously it goes without saying that the, the single biggest difference between uh, Formula One engine wise and, and uh, IndyCar is, is the engine which is turbocharged. This develops probably a little bit more power than the aspirated engine and certainly a little bit more torque. You don't feel it um, too much more because of the weight of the car on acceleration, deacceleration. Just moving around there to the front, we have the availability that when we make a pit stop, we can actually adjust the front wing. So if we have an understeering car or an oversteering car aerodynamically, we have the, uh, literally the facility to either turn this in or turn it out. If we've got too much oversteer, then obviously we'll lower this wing just a little bit, one or two turns. And equally, if we've got too much understeer, then we'll bring this flap up and give the car a little bit more downforce at the front. The gear lever. I haven't had one in the Williams for a few years and a uh, little bit of nostalgia there. It's the actual same knob that I won quite a few races with uh, the Williams team. The one thing that you can see, especially on an oval, is how strong everything is. Everything's very, very solid and of course it has to be because of the G-force that you're actually pulling. This is the air jack. You put the air jack in top of there and that's what lifts the car up very, very quickly indeed. And you've got to be careful your feet are nowhere near in case it collapses. The incredible thing is with an Indy car as opposed to a Formula One car is that before you get into an Indy car at a race meeting on an oval, you think that it's been in an accident already. I mean, if you can see, the whole thing is tilted. If I just move out the way here, can you see? The whole thing is preloaded to the left and uh, the car's always turning left, which going into the left-hand turns is, is sort of fairly important. But the problem is, as you come out the turn, to go straight, you must exert a lot of force in the opposite direction to keep the car going in a straight line. The two men who made the unlikely possible and brought Nigel to IndyCar, Paul Newman and Carl Haas, co-owners of the race team partners for a decade. The challenge coming into focus as the first race was less than a month away and testing continued apace at Phoenix. The track deserted, except for the crew and the media. 
For those from Britain, a whole new experience. But not top of the bill here, Paul Newman, one of the excited onlookers on pit road. Even hand-timed, Nigel was quick, breaking the unofficial lap record. Rapid progress indeed, the boss obviously impressed. The signs were good. Those initial outings cemented the solid relationship within the team for the season. Nigel was following a popular, capable driver at Newman Haas in Michael Andretti, a former champion. He was teaming up with his father, Mario Andretti, but straight away he'd proved he was out of the top draw. Now time for business, but first, smile please. This is enjoyable and you've got some great people, great sponsors and some absolutely fabulous racing and I'm just looking forward to doing it. Immediately prior to the first race in Australia, Nigel met his new friends. How was that for the first attempt? <laughs> oh boy, oh boy. But the rocket ride is the one that counts. That was the most brilliant experience of my life to date. Forgive me, I'm a little bit out of breath, but obviously now when Slim's finished playing, we've got to go straight back to the business of racing. Pole position secured at Surface Paradise, but this was Nigel's first rolling start for years and his lack of experience showed. You can't practice this. And in the early stages, he dropped from first to fourth. After 15 laps, he was ahead again, outbreaking Emerson Fittipaldi until a stop-go penalty cost him the lead once more. Still, he stormed back and won after 65 gruelling laps. I mean, I wanted to be competitive and I was motivated because I never actually had won in Australia before in my Formula One career. So to sit on the pole and win the race uh, in Australia in the opening event was just uh, something very special again. First race of the season and history made. Nigel, the first man to win from pole on his IndyCar debut. There is a lot to learn and it's a different science on an oval and uh, you know, that's going to be the biggest challenge in two weeks' time. Phoenix was the site of his first race on an oval, completely different to anything he'd tried before. It's a simple layout, but it's not easy. There was tension in the air as Nigel, the quickest man on the track, set off again in a bid to improve even further. He knew that one small mistake could equal big trouble. It happened. The impact speed was estimated at 182 miles an hour. The expert IndyCar safety team was there immediately, gently lifting Nigel from the wreck. There was a massive crash, the track littered with debris from the car and the wall. Nigel stretched away to the air ambulance. Now the anxious wait for news. Concussion, said the doctors initially. Roseanne was kept busy with well wishes, concerned about the new guy in the hole in the wall gang. Needless to say, um, I must apologise to all of you out there for not 
being able to compete in the race tomorrow. Um, you obviously know the reason why. But I mean, I tell you, no one ever in the history of Phoenix Raceway has ever punched a hole in the <laughs> concrete wall. And apparently we did that. On race day, Nigel flew back home to Florida. Should be at the racetrack, as you know. But we're just about to fly off uh, back to Florida. Hopefully by mid-afternoon I'll be being readmitted to hospital. I've got a problem with my lower back. It's just one of those things, I'm afraid. I'm told that every driver's been in the wall there. And it's just unfortunate that I've joined the club a bit earlier than I'd anticipated. It just goes to show how quickly an oval can bite you, and uh, it bit me real good. And you know, everybody knows the result. I was uh, knocked unconscious for some time, and uh, I basically split my back internally open, and uh, everybody knows what happened after that, and it put me out that weekend, and uh, I struggled then for two to three months to even get back. Such injuries would sideline commentators, let alone a driver, but at Long Beach two weeks later, Nigel was back, hurtling round the street circuit to claim pole position. The cockpit was padded to make it more comfortable, but it was also a tighter fit. Nigel's problem had been located. A large pocket of fluid in the lower back that had to be drained continually. An operation imperative, but timing was crucial. At Long Beach, Nigel went on to finish third in the race. Considering the injuries, a phenomenal effort. Very good. Now for second place, and these guys... Indianapolis, with its month-long program of testing and qualifying, was next on the agenda. He had a serious injury. Uh, he had a lot of conservative treatment to, cut, to try and get over that. Uh, we did everything we could to avoid surgery, but it got to the point that if he uh, were going to have a chance to race at Indy and to continue the race season, uh, he, he had to have surgery. I mean, this is a man that, that had a significant injury and he's um, exhibited a, a total uh, dedication to his sport to uh, try and have this surgery done at the only possible time it could be done that could get him back on the track at Indy. Nigel was determined not to miss the sights and sounds of Indianapolis. It's a great result for him. In the world's toughest race, he came home third after leading into the closing stages. It was only a late yellow that ruined his chances of a debut victory in the Indy 500. A week after the grueling race at Indy, on to Milwaukee, with his three greatest fans there too. Nigel had learnt all he could about oval racing by now after the experiences at Phoenix and Indianapolis. At Milwaukee, he was simply unbeatable. Pit, Nigel, pit! Coming into the pit. Just gonna top it with fuel and we're gonna put new tires because we got about 60 laps left. the pits for the run to the flag but again a caution had closed up the field I mean I jumped that restart as, as, as early as I thought I could jump it and yet coming out of that first at the fourth turn to the to the green flag I looked in my mirrors and it was full of the the orange car and yellow car of, of Ralph Bazell a fine win Nigel's first on an oval, confirming him in the lead of the championship. But there were still 11 rounds to go. Good job, champ. Great job. Hell of a job. Oh, yeah, didn't get me that side on the restart. I know it. We had confidence in you. Thanks, everybody. Great job. 
Golf has proved the ideal pastime for Nigel, if pastime's the word for such a competitor. Fitness can't be risked playing contact sports, at least not too often. Nigel's an accomplished golfer, single-figure handicap. The chance of a game rarely declined. Bobby Rahal, one of the first to suggest a round. I'm one up. We'll just ignore right now. I'm one up, yeah. In 1992, Rahal won his third IndyCar championship, his first as an owner-driver. One of America's most popular sportsmen, he says his golf handicap is about 10. So we're just having a bit of relaxation, and uh, what do you think of it so far? Today? Yeah. Well, I'm, I'm three down, <laughs> aren't I? So uh, it could be better, but it's been fun. Great putt. Great putt. Get in, beauty. Thank you. Fabulous three. Thank you. Well, as you can see, he's coming to his own now. He's come back. We're level going into the last hole. Birdie on the last hole. He saw the up and down there. He's a bandit. Now we're going to get a reputation. Yeah. <laughs> ball there. Oh, I talked him into it. Go on, Bo. Go on, Bo. <laughs> we'll show you what friendship is. We'll give you that one. <laughs> there you go. I think that's 10 bucks, Bob. Is that okay? <laughs> like is that shot. Australian or is that <laughs> Canadian or US? Well, I think, uh, as long as it's legal currency, I don't no mind. Problem. But I can tell you one thing. It's going to be far harder to beat on the racetrack. Nigel took possession of his new jet aircraft capable of flying transatlantic non-stop which proved useful when there were one or two errands to perform. <laughs> like calling into Madame Tussauds in London to, well, spot the difference. This has got to be one of the signs of having made it to the top of your profession. To have an effigy exhibited at the famous waxworks. This made a decent photograph, two Nigel Mansells, when the opposition is finding one hard enough to tackle. And the occasion wouldn't have been complete without a celebratory drop of bubbly. And another honour for Nigel Mansell. Birmingham University awarded him an honorary doctorate in engineering. And the family looked on at the ceremony performed by the vice chancellor. To of my authorities, Vice Chancellor, I admit you to the degree of Doctor of Engineering on Morris Castle. This was surely an appropriate award for Nigel, who began his working life as an engineer in Birmingham. And there was another trophy to collect at the RAC Club in Pall Mall, the Seagrave Trophy, in acknowledgement of his outstanding achievements. He became a proud recipient following the likes of Sir Malcolm Campbell, Sterling Moss and Jackie Stewart. Back to America, back to work, learning the circuits. By Cleveland, round eight of 16, Nigel was leading the championship by 14 points from Raoul Bazell with Emerson Fittipaldi third, 16 points behind. At Cleveland, Nigel and Emerson enjoyed a great scrap over second place. Brilliant entertainment. One of the local sports writers in Ohio described this battle as being like watching two heavyweight prize fighters slugging it out with lefts and rights for the world championship. But it was even more spectacular than that, wheel-to-wheel -wheel racing at speeds approaching 200 miles an hour. Two absolute masters of their craft involved in a superlative battle for position. No question it was exciting and dangerous, but these two kept up an incredible level of competition without being reckless. Fittipaldi, world champion in 1972 and 1974, won the IndyCar title in 1989. This duel between champions was one of the highlights of a brilliant season.
but then problems at Toronto, ninth on the grid after a series of troubles. The main opposition in good form as well, with Fittipaldi on pole position. Then the car would do this. I mean, that was a nightmare. We, we um, went there and the setup we had on the cars uh, perhaps weren't quite right. I had two major accidents on the one day, um, one where I braked and uh, we were so low that the car was basically on the ground and I lost my steering and I went straight on into the war and then, uh, you know, the second one was later in the afternoon and uh, I lost the back end again over a bump and just went straight in the outside war. But I mean, um, you know, it was, um, I look at that weekend extraordinary as a lucky weekend. Why do I look at that as a lucky weekend? I have, I've had one mechanical failure this year with a turbocharger, with a wastegate, and it was that weekend. So, I mean, I could have been winning that race and had the failure, right? We had a dreadful weekend. The car was not competitive in the race at all. It was running in ninth or eighth place, and the car failed. It actually did me a favor. <laughs> so, I mean, I look at it from a positive point of view. For almost a decade on the Isle of Man, Nigel saw service as a special constable. In a rare break from track action, Nigel became an honorary member of the FBI when he went along with Roseanne and the American TV commentator Paul Page to the FBI headquarters in Indiana. Well, there you have it. Honorary member of the FBI, so be careful. It goes too fast. <laughs> oh, there is to it. Oh, this is great. And that <laughs> you watch the metal. <laughs> oh, first uh, machine gun I've ever shot in my life, and. Uh, well, normally I hope it will be the last time I shoot a machine gun. Woo. Okay. Woo. Yeah, lean into it. Lean into it. Yeah. That's a, that's got a big kick because short barrel. <laughs> that's enough with that one. <laughs> yeah, that's that's that hurts. I hate it. I hate it. <laughs> that reminds me Anybody of the war in it? Phoenix. That one did. <laughs> that got a good kick. Back to oval racing on the first day of August, Michigan, the second 500 miler in the IndyCar series. Nigel hadn't won since the beginning of June. He wasn't feeling 100%, but in the race, it was Mansell against Andretti for the lead. Nigel in, in. Plus one lap on the field, Nigel. Plus one lap on the field. This is absolutely killing me. At the pit stop, aspirin was added to Nigel's water bottle. I don't feel too good. Hey, we got about uh, 85 laps to go. You don't have to reset the meter if you want. Down there in pit road, the team owners were concerned. Could Nigel see it through? But although he was feeling sick and had a rotten headache, he made it right to the finish. Well, hell of a job. Great job. That really puts us up at the point. Super. A splendid victory. Nigel's first for a couple of months and one of the very best of his whole career. The Monaco is a tough race. The hardest races we've ever had in Brazil in 120 degrees heat. This is tougher. I mean, it's tougher on the machinery, it's tougher on the driver, and, uh, you know, it's just been a complete new experience uh, from every uh, aspect, both from the heat, the physical part, getting beaten up a bit, you know, and, um, and then the amount of pit stops and just getting everything to go right. I can tell you, truly moving, exciting, and uh, a little bit bewildering at times. Happy birthday to you! Happy birthday to you! Happy birthday, dear Nigel! <laughs> Happy 
A double celebration in New England. First, Nigel hit the big 4-0, and then he won the race. His second victory on an oval in a week. Yeah, I mean, what a birthday present. I mean, if you've got to turn 40, that's the way to do it. And, uh, you know, uh, I just said to myself on race day, well, you haven't given yourself a really good birthday present of late, so uh, let's win today. Up until 10 laps to go, you know, I'd almost said, you know, you've got to settle for third place. And uh, then I said, uh, I tried to turn the boost up a little bit, and I went to sixth gear, which was the highest gear, but I thought if I could slingshot out the corners a little bit more and I was getting loose, perhaps I could just pull the extra few revs. And sometimes the trick is go in a higher gear, drop the revs and increase the boost so it doesn't pop the valve. And it worked for me, and um, as you saw, we just had an incredible uh, race those uh, last 10 laps. Oh, this is it! Basil takes the lead with four laps to go. What a move! And New England really was some victory, fighting back after a delay in the pits to take Fittipaldi and Tracy. A deserved win, a race that will be remembered for Nigel's daring and racecraft. By now, Nigel was leading the championship by 25 points with five rounds to go. And Chloe was the first in line for the hugs from Dad afterwards. She knows he's a star. And this all seems to be part of the job these days. Making up for the commercials. Some say they're better than the TV programs. It could be. They take just as long to make. And just look at the extras. For this one, they used footage from one of Nigel's less successful races, Mid-Ohio. Never mind. In this case, it's not the result that counts. This commercial was shot at Nigel's local Texaco garage in Clearwater. He's a regular customer, so the rest didn't mind having to wait. It's amazing what's going on, but I'm really grateful for the stand-in because it's currently about 100 degrees and uh, He's setting up all the rehearsal, getting the shots and the camera angles exactly right and then when it's all ready to go then I'll suit up and, and jump in the car and, and reenact it. Win, Nigel, any hairy moments? Oh, yeah, for a moment back there, I almost forgot the whole meal. Going into the penultimate race of the season, there were just two championship contenders left Nigel Mansell and Emerson Fittipaldi. The venue, Nazareth, Pennsylvania, a one mile oval. Nigel dropped back to fourth with poor handling and then fought his way all the way back past Fittipaldi for second and still he attacked. Now he is beginning to challenge Paul Tracy. So here is a fight for the lead and look at him dial inside of Tracy. The crowd comes to their feet and begins to cheer as Mansell comes into the lead. 
Yes, it was Nigel in charge again, commanding the race and even lapping his teammate Mario Andretti. And he has everybody in a firm headlock at the moment, trying to get a submission. Mansell is being brutal here on his competitors. He is superb and in total control. Emerson Fittipaldi, meanwhile, was sensing as the race ran into the closing stages that his chance of a second Indy Championship had gone. But down in pit lane, Paul Newman was taking nothing for granted. While the Newman Haas team manager Jim McGee coolly saw the job through to the finish. Coming up to one lap to go, and Nigel still forcing his way through the field. His lead increasing to half a lap over Scott Goodyear by the chequered flag. Everyone else at least two laps back as Nigel came through to complete victory. He'd now won on every oval since Indianapolis. Great job, Nigel. Great job. The championship, that's it. We did it. Here's Emerson finish. Job, champ. What a deal. Here's Emerson finish. Emerson finished uh, fifth. You're the champ. You're the champ. <laughs> Fantastic! We've won the championship! Yes! You won it! You won it! Everybody has just done a fantastic job, I can't thank you enough. We've definitely won the championship as well, yeah! Hey, great job guys! And this was just the start of the celebrations, a rookie had clinched the title. Nigel Mansell, the first Englishman and the first rookie to win the championship since it all began back in 1916. Congratulations there from Scott Goodyear, second on the day that history was made. And Roseanne, Nigel's wife, best friend and supporter. The decision to leave Formula One for the States now vindicated and everyone else queuing up to offer their congratulations. The triumph was complete. Nigel Mansell, IndyCar champion for 1993. It makes you feel so proud. I mean, the feelings I have are exactly the same, if not better than the feelings when I won the World Championship last year. And I think uh, last year I had a lot of things uh, going my way. Number one, I didn't have a major accident at the second race and I didn't have to undergo an operation during the course of last year. And there's no question we had some uh, great backing and great machinery behind us. What makes this so special is how close it was. And, um, you know, I'm just grateful to all the sponsors, but I can't thank Carl and Paul publicly enough for, you know, making a, a very, very special dream come true. The picture of the season. But just one more question, Nigel. How about next year? Hollywood, perhaps? Nigel! Nigel! Nigel, look! We need you back in Europe. Oh, boy, I don't know. Here's the deal. You get everything you get in now plus the best car. Everything I'm getting now? Everything. Texaco fuel, Havilene oil? No. I'll get back to you on that. Who was that guy, Nigel? Just someone after my autograph. Oh. 